Hello and welcome to The Situation Report today. Very glad to have you joining me. This is the show where we do our best to give you the information and perspectives you need to navigate an ever-changing culture. My name is Jeremy Stolnecker. I am your host. And today we are going to talk about limits. <laughs> limits on our freedoms, limits on what the founders intended for us, specifically in the areas of the First and Second Amendment. We are uh, living, again, through a cultural moment. I, I say that all the time. I use that phrase because it feels like we're living through a cultural moment all the time. But we're in one of those weird times that comes up from time to time throughout the course of history where people who disagree with other people <laughs> demand that those they disagree with limit the rights that they have as Americans, as we'll discuss today in this interview, really the rights that God gave to us um, as, as humans, as his creation. And so there is constantly a, a, a conversation around how far should the rights that are guaranteed to us, how far should they go? How far should we allow them to go? What should we expect? Should there be limitations? How should we view that? And as people of faith, how should we think about those? When it comes to freedom of speech, how should I think about freedom of speech? Uh, how far personally should I go? How should I think about what I say and what I'm willing to even not say in some places? When we look at the Second Amendment, are there limitations? And if so, what are they and why do they exist? How should we think about these things? I firmly believe that many of the problems those in the faith community are having are the result of not understanding why we believe what we believe. Theologically, biblically, historically, we don't understand why we believe. We hold the right position, but we could never explain to another person why we hold that position. And we have uh, really hurt ourselves and hurt the culture at large as a result. Today we're going to, going to talk about some of these things. My guest, uh, very grateful to have him on with me today, is Davis Yance. Um, if you're not familiar with his work, he is an attorney. He's been interviewed just about everywhere. Um, he, he's a litigator, speaks on so many different legal topics, uh, served in the United States military, retired from the United States Air Force, was a JAG officer, legal officer in the Air Force. In addition to that, now through his law firm has represented many service members who have had to deal with vaccine mandates and other COVID-related mandates. Very grateful to have him on today to help break down some of these issues. Please enjoy, learn from, appreciate this interview with my guest, Davis Gantz. Davis, thank you so much for uh, for joining me today. Really appreciate it. I know you're very busy, and I'm uh, so thankful you come on and have this conversation with us today. Oh, man, it's an honor. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, there are, as I just mentioned before we hit record, so many things I'd like to talk about. <laughs> talk about. Um, your life, your experience, your work, it intersects so much of what's happening in culture right now. Um, but specifically, and, and I will sp stick to the topic we had uh, discussed earlier, is limits on, I would say limits on our rights, but limits on what the founders intended when they gave us the Bill of Rights. Um, we are having so many conversations culturally about uh, speech, what that means to have and express freedom of speech, speech what's that, what that looks like. Um, and then even into other things like gun control, uh, you know, again, even this week, um, we are seeing, you know, violence, gun violence, and that always brings up a conversation about limitations on the Bill of Rights and limitations on what we have been guaranteed, these protections. Um, so, so I'd like to just kind of start, first of all, with a maybe just a broad explanation of the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, so that we can then move from that to, okay, well, then what are the limitations, if any, and how should we view that and how should we think about that? Yeah, so there's so much to cover, but I, I think the best starting point is to really understand kind of the purpose and intent of the founders with the Bill of Rights. You know, I, I think a big mistake we make as conservatives and sometimes as Christians when we address these issues is we sort of engage in a little bit of constitution worship. 
Um, mm. and, and I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way. It's so important, but, but we really miss the point if we don't take a step back and look at what, what was the foundation the constitution was based upon? What really was the environment? What was the air the founders were breathing when they came up with the idea of, of the bill of rights? And I, I think we have to start there. So there's a couple of things. First, you know, they really were heavily influenced by the Bible and, and Old Testament biblical law. Other than Montesquieu, the most common uh, referenced book in in any of the debate about the fa- by the founders, whether it was on the floor of the Continental Congress, whether it was in written correspondence, was actually the book of Deuteronomy. Not just the wow. Bible, but specifically yeah, wow. the book of Deuteronomy. So I think that's really, really critical just as a starting yeah. point to understand that's the worldview. That was the environment of the founders, regardless of their specific faith, where, where, they, where they're at. That was... That was the air they were breathing. Those were the things they were reading. So we have to kind of walk into it with that. The other foundational thing I think we need to look at is just the difference between the idea of positive rights versus negative rights. So we have to understand our nation was founded from the viewpoint that it is God that gives inalienable rights yeah. to individuals yeah. and to people, not the government. And far too often when we start to hear culturally discussions about rights, we start with this idea, well, I, you know, the second amendment gives me the right or the first amendment gives me the right. And I would challenge us to just say, no, 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 this is a God given right. This is, this is a human right. Let's begin there. And if we start there, then we have a much better understanding of the concepts and what was behind sort of the first and, and second amendment. So I always like to begin there and say, no, it's not government. These are natural rights given to us by a creator God. All humans share them. These are human rights in, in that respect. We have to start there. So, you know, with that in mind, we can start with the First Amendment. We can say, okay, what are basic human rights that are, that our founders were attempting to capture in, in the First Amendment? And they weren't trying to capture everything. This wasn't meant to be an exclusive list. These were just the basics saying, hey, the federal government, to the extent it exists, cannot infringe upon, cannot restrict these Mm. things. So association, free speech, free exercise of religion, those are all things that are part of, of the First Amendment. And the idea was the government is not going to be in the business of telling people how to think, who they can interact with, right. and what specific religious faith they can be a part of. Right. So that that's um, the starting point for there. Okay, go, so, go ahead. Yeah, so when we think about that, and I, it's so critical that we start with inalienable rights given to us by God. God gives us our, our rights, right? And that's, again, a place I think most of us overlook or move past quickly, and we don't understand that. So we look to the government. We, we've seen this. Uh, I go off on a rat, rabbit trail, right? But we've seen this over the last couple of years. Well, if the government gives us our rights, then we have to do what the government says. And when the government wants to restrict them, well, they came. From, it's just not true. So that's a, an incredible starting point. Um, but as people interpret speech and religious expression and, and those other uh, areas that are encapsulated in the First Amendment, depending on where you fall politically, depending on what you personally believe, you may view that as having more or less impact on your life. Uh, there are limitations to what other people can do. There should never be limitations on what I can do. Um, To some extent, um, free exercise of religion is wonderful unless it's a religion that's very uncomfortable to me or something that I don't like or something that espouses views that I don't appreciate. I should be able to say whatever I want to in any public forum, but you should not because your speech is hate speech as classified by me. Right. So this is the crazy world we're living in. How do you deconstruct that when it comes to the question of what are the limitations on let's say speech or free exercise of religion. How do we think about that? How do we interpret that? How do we understand where the line is? Clearly there has to be a line, (laughs) but what is that line? Right. And and so I think we have to, it helps to kind of understand where we're at in American jurisprudence generally today, right? So where we're kind of at right now is is helpful just to go over that quickly. And then we can kind of talk about where we should be going and and kind of answers for the future, especially as Christians, as we try to bring our worldview to bear. So really, when we think of when we think of free speech today, and we think of the way that courts consistently interpret the First Amendment, 
Um, you know, there's been a drift, but generally speaking, they're, they're big on freedom of the press, meaning, you know, there should be a free press. So newspapers, journalists should have the freedom to be able to write and tell stories. They should be able to protect their sources. That's all sort of part of, right. of free speech. Um, generally speaking, our courts still have a healthy respect for political speech. In other words, we're not going to do things generally to restrict the free speech of someone who is advocating on a political issue, someone who is running for office, things like that. Generally speaking, um, the federal government and state governments aren't allowed to interfere with that. When it comes to other types of speech, um, there again, there's sort of cycles of, of thoughts in the law on this. But generally speaking, speaking, our courts are still going to respect viewpoint uh, speech, meaning you can't discriminate just because you have a particular set of beliefs or you're going to say something. And really, our, our, our courts, even the Supreme Court, has recognized something or rejected something they call the heckler's veto, right? So there's this idea that you, uh, that if someone is offended by your speech, that you shouldn't be able to do it, right? So if someone's offended by it, it needs to stop. And that's called the heckler's veto. Our mm. courts have generally rejected that, meaning just because it's going to offend somebody, hurt their feelings, make them sad, whatever it is, the heckler yeah. doesn't get to veto the speech. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of limitations on speech. People talk about the idea of there, you can't say something with the intent to harm someone else because it's untrue or you can't incite intentionally incite violence, you know, speech yeah. that's reasonably intended yeah. to cause violence should be avoided. So there are some of those limitations. That's, that's kind of where we're at. But, you know, as Christians, when we think about free speech, I, I think we need to take a step back. And I really strongly believe we have to start from the, posi the position of what is the role of government anyway? What does biblical government look mm. like? You know, and I really believe it should be limited and if we approach it from limited government, then there's a lot of things our government does from a free speech standpoint that it just shouldn't be involved in at all. Because yeah. if the role of government really is to protect the innocent and punish the wicked, um, there's not going to be a lot of content restriction of speech anyway. Um, so I hope that kind of helps frame it a yeah. little bit. But I, I, we do see danger. There's a lot of danger. One of the things, of course, our founders didn't anticipate it looking like it does, but certainly had in their mind was the idea that government would somehow control or influence media and silence voices through that. And that's what we've seen, right? That's a huge fear. We see censorship and it's not necessarily government censorship. No. It's sort of government influenced censorship by, by private companies who want to be able to um, benefit from government contracts. So we say, oh, Google censoring people. That's not the government. Well, Look, Amazon made their money and made a lot of their money by providing government contracted web servers to the federal yeah. government and the Department of Defense. So, of course, Google has a financial business incentive to listen to government leaders when they say, hey, you should limit certain types of speech. Same with Twitter and other organizations. Maybe sometimes the direct tie to a government contract isn't there, but we've certainly seen that that influence take hold. So um, one, one of the struggles... <clears throat> I think with that, in, in that framework that um, I mean, I'll just say I have and others I would imagine also struggle with is as a Christian, my standard is different than people who are, you know, I, I use a phrase outside of the faith, I guess, or whatever, not Christians, right? They don't, they don't care what the Bible says. <laughs> they, don't, they don't care what God thinks. Um, and so as a Christian, though, I need to steward over that right that I have. As an American, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, this, is, this is one of the conversations I had often during the, the height of the pandemic is in the United States, we have so many blessings when it comes to our rights that we as Christians can take advantage of and should take advantage of and should steward over that people in other countries just don't have, even though our rights come from God. Um, other governments don't recognize that, right, or haven't. But how do we steward over speech well as Christians? How do you how do you think about that? There, so the government should not limit our speech, but there has to be, there should be boundaries in our own speech and our own thinking about what we communicate, when we do, how we do. How do you think about that, or how should we process that? Well, I, I think it's a great question, and it does go back to sort of the moral foundations the, the founders were working from, right? And so we can't buy into a myth of neutrality, and I think Christians do sure, that far sure. too often. Our churches yeah. do that too often. We buy into this idea that there's 
there's neutral things that there are things that are not uh, influenced by religion, you know, and I very yeah. strongly believe in everything we do. We're either worshiping man or worshiping God. There is no neutrality. Those are the mm-hmm. two choices. It's yeah. a binary choice. Yeah. Right. And, and so I think we have to, as Christians, we kind of have to start with that and say, okay, what, what are we doing? What are we saying? Why are we saying it? What is our motivation? And is this bringing glory to God? And that, that's, that's the framework we have to start with now. Just because we say, hey, there's a different standard of speech that we might put on others um, doesn't it doesn't mean we're, we're totally abandoning that principle. And really, historically, if you look at the history of free speech, you've seen the most free speech in nations like America where there was a, a biblical law founding, a biblical law basis for what we're doing. So, you know, the idea of Christian nationalism or other kind of terms out there that yeah. we're going to come in and legislate morality, that's the wrong basis. We, you, every, every piece of legislation has a morality to it, but you only see the opportunity for freedom to flourish in a nation where people recognize a creator God and understand that God doesn't use force to convert people. He may call yeah. his elect. He may, the Holy Spirit may work on people's hearts, but God, our religion is not about force. And so freedom really has only existed within that Christian biblical law framework. So that starts with Christians having respect having respect for others and trying to understand how we glorify God and all of our communications. And then common grace falls from that, right? Common grace falls from that. People model that and you can have a free and flourishing society. Yeah, man, that's so good. I, I've, i um, you're in the military, I was in the military and I've had this conversation with people a lot that as a Christian for me in the United States Marine Corps, I didn't view my responsibility as defending the rights or the freedoms of people that are like me, but I'm thankful for the opportunity to defend the rights of people who aren't like me, who disagree with me, who don't look like me or sound like me, wouldn't go to the same church that I go to and would hold differing opinions. And I I don't know if it's culture. I don't know what it is exactly that has pushed, I think, even Christians back into a corner where we have become so polarized that instead of viewing the opportunity we have to defend the speech of others and defend the rights of others to live and and respond to God a, according to their conscience, uh, we have almost gotten to the point where we've adopted what the left has done and what we push back on and what we scream about. If you're not like us, then you know go somewhere else or leave. Right. It, it's just such a weird place to be, and I think Christians have always maintained the balance while speaking truth. But that truth with grace, I don't know if that sound, if that came across right, but I think we've lost that as Christians. And as a Christian community, we've always been able to do that. And we've moved so far away from that. Well, I, I think too, I mean, I, I do think we, we have to wonder sometimes if we're in, in a little bit of a Romans one type scenario where, yeah, sure, where the rope sure. is, is pulling back because I think too many Christians and churches kind of bought into a myth of neutrality and we weren't. Yeah approaching public space, public commentary, even politics from a Christian perspective and understanding the common grace that comes from that. So, you know, that vacuum is going to be filled and, you know, you talk about trite phrases, but it's Christ or chaos. I do think that's a reality. So we see this sort of chaotic, you know, loss of the ability to love others and be civil. And we really should be going back to the idea that all humans are created in the image of God. And what an honor to serve in a military that protects every human being's basic fundamental rights. That's that's what we're all about. So no, I think what you said made a lot of sense. Well, and somewhere along the, the way, we as a Christian community have lost the ability to articulate why we believe what we believe. That's why I think mm-hmm. conversations like this one are so important. Because if you can't explain why you believe it, then you resort to bullying and <laughs> screaming loudly. Um, I heard someone talk about this recently in, in kind of the transgender debate. The reason Christians should speak up about these issues, in addition to it being, you know, antithetical to to pursuing God and honoring God, is because we care about the people. I talked to my kids about this a couple of days ago. Yes, we care about the people that are caught up in this. I think there are certainly people with an agenda, a, a, an anti-God, satanic agenda. I believe that exists. Um, you know, there are men- people with real mental illness. There, but I think in the middle of all of that are a lot of very confused young people who we should love and have compassion for. And we have to speak truth because they need to hear the truth, not because we're Christians and that's what we're supposed to do. And we've lost our ability to communicate why. And so we've just picked up a baseball bat and started hitting people with it. And it's not helpful. Right. 
No, it's not helpful. I equate it in, in some, I think my pastor was talking about this, but I equate it to sort of the concept of someone's, someone's bleeding out, right? They're, they have a head injury and they're yeah. bleeding out and they're going to die and we yeah. come across them. And, and they don't even know what the problem is because they have a head injury, right? right. They lost consciousness right. or otherwise. You know, what's the loving, kind thing to do? The loving, kind thing to, to do for them is not to say, you know, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings by telling you you're dying. Right. The, the loving and kind thing to do is say, hey, I, I love you. I care about you. Let me help. Let me treat you. Let me get you to yeah. a hospital. So yeah. there's kind of two sides to that. We don't come up to that person and say and yell at them and say, hey, you, you know, you shouldn't have been careless and caused yourself a head injury. Yeah. Um, and that was wrong and that was stupid and then walk away. We need to help them. We need to get them treatment. At the same time, we would be, it would be the ultimate cruelty to let them die and not tell them the truth, even if they're disoriented or otherwise. And I think to me, that was a great way to kind of get to that point. We, we have to speak truth. We have to help. And that's the problem, you know. Far too often in our churches, and I, I've sat in churches and, and heard it, um, we we approach it from a perspective of, you know, the Bible says that that this is sin and it leads to death, but we're really sorry about that. And we want you to know we love you anyway. And, and we sort sure, of start sure, with sure. apologizing yeah. for the Bible yeah. Yeah. rather than saying, no, if we follow God's law, if we follow all of Scripture, that's a blessing. That's how we're blessed. That's how families are blessed. Individuals are blessed. Nations are yeah, blessed. And that's, that's loving. And, and that's what we can't apologize for. But yeah, we have to be, and we have to be so kind in the way we approach it. Um, cause we have to see the lost for the law, for what they are. They're yeah. lost. Man, that's good. And I think then, you know, getting to back to this issue is that's what puts the guardrails up and keeps us on track as we say or don't say what needs to be said or, kept personal, like some things don't need to be said, right? Um, and that's what allows us to steward over that that gift that God has given to us. Um, yeah, that's so good. When we look at, and again, we could spend all day just talking about the First <laughs> Amendment um, and the components of that, but looking at the Second Amendment, looking at gun control, looking at these issues, um, I, 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 and I can acknowledge, right, these are two separate issues, I get that. Um, but but the push for limiting our rights um, is very mm -hmm. much the same in both of these. And yes. I think the implication long term culturally and societally will be very much the same if we allow that to happen. Um, we can say that our words hurt people and then we can laugh about that because that's ridiculous and it, that's easier to deal with. When it comes to gun violence, particularly in the United States, we know that that is real. Um, right. Even this week, we've had uh, people killed in a senseless shooting by someone who, for whatever reason, thought that that was the right thing to do. Um, we see this frequently in the United States. Um, and the call is always to then limit our freedom. If there right. were fewer guns, these things would not happen. Uh, that's ridiculous on its face, but that's the argument that's made. And then there are compassionate people who say, well, then we need to limit our right. We need to limit, mm -hmm. I mean, we care more about people than we care about guns or whatever. Um, right. How do we think about that? How do we think, again, as Christians, and, and I have very strong opinions and you know, I, I can... <laughs> I can argue this, right? But right. as a Christian, how do I address that with people? You know, f for me, I think we have to we have to go back to a foundational principle, and we have to ask the question: Why? Why was this right? Why was this That's right good. included in the Constitution in the first place? Let, let's start there. And it was included. I firmly believe, as a, you know, a legal scholar, historian, looking at this, it was there because the founders recognized that all human beings are created in the image of God and they have an inherent right to life, life, mm. liberty, the pursuit yep. of happiness. So the whole point behind the Second Amendment, one of the founding principles behind it is absolutely a recognition of an inherent right to self-defense, right? Every human being should have the ability to protect yeah. themselves yeah. from the bad guys, right? To, to protect their own life. And, you know, I think husbands, fathers have an obligation to protect their family. Um, and, and to, to do that. So I think, you know, the whole concept behind the Second Amendment is really this idea of life, protecting life, the inherent right to self-defense. And that holds true for the military. You know, as a JAG, when I deployed, I would do, you know, uh, rules for the use of force briefings, rules of engagement briefings. And I would always start with this. I would look my guys in the eye and I'd say, look, you have the inherent right 
to defend yourself. I don't want you to be out there engaged right. in action right. thinking that you have to hesitate if you truly believe your life or the life of the airman standing next to you is in danger. Yeah. You are free to engage. You always have that right. Everything else about the rules for the use of force, the rules of engagement, we can work through. But it begins there and that principle doesn't go away. And I think the same holds true for this debate. We have to start with that principle or are free citizens, are free people, do the, do you have a right to defend yourself and to protect yourself? And for me, and, and I know for you, for you, for the background you're coming from, that's why we're so passionate about yeah. the right to bear arms is it's, it's about protecting life. It's about self-defense. I firmly believe that the First Amendment is protected by the Second Amendment. And I've, I've said that many, many times. Without the Second Amendment, the First Amendment goes away. And, and that's, in my mind, where these two have a, an intersecting point. Um, but even with that, there are some issues that come up. And again, these are so important for us to, to understand so that we can clearly talk about them, right? Uh, gun people, and I know a lot of gun people, and some might even call me a gun people. <laughs> um, they can be kind of ignorant and kind of obnoxious about this stuff, right? right. Um, like I personally believe if you want a tank, then you should be able to have one. That's my personal belief. I live in California. No one here owns tanks. Right. Um, I, I would not put a limitation on caliber of weapons or even the rate at which a, a weapon can fire. Like, like personally, I don't, I don't think those limitations should exist, but they do. Um, but we do get into issues like background checks and, you know, all of these other issues that – uh, many people in the camp that I would be a part of would say those are limitations on the Second Amendment. Um, how do you view those things? Again, as a responsible citizen, <laughs> as a father, um, and, and as a Christian, how do we view that? How does that intersect with what the founders intended? Well, I, I think, again, I, the, the founders are too intense, the right to self-defense and also the right to protect yourself from tyrants, whether that was robbers, whether that was, yeah. uh, you know, just yeah. other threats on the frontier, whether that was, you know, national, local government tyrants. So there's absolutely that ability to protect from tyrants. Legally, what the Second Amendment says is shall not be infringed, meaning the yeah. federal government cannot infringe upon that right. However, I will say this. I don't think it's wrong biblically to say that if you are a wicked person, if you have yeah. committed a criminal yeah. act, and we would, in modern terms, would say a felon. If you are a felon, you have engaged in violent criminal activity. I don't think it's unreasonable for a free society to say, well, then you have forfeited certain rights and privileges. And so I do think there, there is a reasonable place for some yeah. level of discussion about what that looks like. I don't think background checks should be, um, you know, I, I think red flag laws can be dangerous, you know, and that's where First Amendment free speech comes in. You know, I look yeah. at this from a perspective. I represent military members whose security clearances are being revoked because of right. things they said that were yeah. true about the COVID-19 vaccine. Yeah. And yeah. they're being accused they were referred to mental health. So I have military members I represent that were referred to mental health simply because of their religious faith. And are they going to come up against a red flag law? So, you know, those are the concerns that I jump to. But as a premise, the idea that someone who is a convicted criminal um, could be restricted in their ability to own a firearm, I think that's reasonable. I think by your actions, by wicked actions, you could give up um, certain rights. Um, I think that's appropriate even in a free society to get there. So I think there can be some reasonable measures. I get very leery of, of what those look like um, very quickly. But as a concept, we can have that discussion, I think. Yeah, it, it, is in, it is interesting to say that someone who has committed a crime should not have a firearm. It's a different thing to say someone who may potentially at some point down the road <laughs> commit a crime should also not have a firearm, right? Exactly. Um, two very, very different things, I think. Two, two very different things. Um, in you know my world working with veterans, uh, I've had conversations with many folks who have said, I have problems, I struggle, I need help, but if I let anyone know that I need help, then the government will take away my ability to defend defend myself. And that is detrimental. I mean, it, it is, it's caused a lot of problems. It's, in fact, I mean, we look at some of the firearm deaths among veterans, and I wonder how many of those could have been prevented if they had gotten the help they needed. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a, what's happening to our veterans is, is a tragedy. That's why some of the work you're doing with Mighty Oaks is so important. But yeah, absolutely. That is a common theme. 20 years of service myself, we've seen it over and over again. Guys need help. 
They need to talk to somebody and they're afraid. They're afraid it's going to hurt their career. And ultimately they're afraid they're going to come up on a red flag law and not be able to, to hunt, not be able to go to the range. I mean, for many veterans, um, man, going to the range and shooting is, is therapy, right? Sure. I mean, it's, it's yeah. good. It's a good thing. It's good for us hunting as well. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a balance there that has to be found. And I don't think the idea of future crime should ever be sure. an area that we go into. That's good, man. I appreciate it. I know these are big issues and there's an awful lot to think about here. Um, I keep running up against people who are, again, having a hard time articulating, you know, why do we believe this? What does this really mean? What does this mean to me? Uh, it breaks my heart to see the Christian community stepping back on so many of these issues. These are two big ones when they should be stepping up and explaining why we believe what we believe and how practically this should play out in in our culture and our society. Um, before we go, I want to leave a few minutes for you to talk about some of the work you have done with the military recently, um, specifically as it relates to COVID. But some of the, the issues you're engaged in right now, again, these are very, very important. And um, as someone who has served and works with the military, I'm very grateful for people like you and, and the work that you're doing. So can you talk about that a little bit just to help people understand what is happening? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a lot going on. Of course, we dealt with the, the COVID mandate and all the infringements on, on religious freedom and other yep. things that went along yep. with that. Right now, what we're seeing in the military, we're still dealing with the aftermath of that. So I'm still working. You know, I still have clients that are trying to put together, piece together their career after that. Clients whose security clearances are being threatened because of their religious faith or stands they've taken. We're also dealing with a lot of folks who were discharged um, before federal injunctions came yep. down or the yep. mandate was rescinded. We're trying to figure out how to correct their military records, upgrade their discharges, get them back in if they want to serve again. Those are sort of immediate things, but big picture. And we're in a dangerous time um, in our military. We see it in the culture, but really in our military right now, there's a, there's a crisis of moral courage. There's a crisis of leadership. And, and we're asking people to volunteer and serve where it's unclear what the mor morality and ethics that is driving the the foreign policy and the internal yeah. policy of our nation yeah. are, you know, and I'm, I'm retired now. I retired as a Lieutenant Colonel from the Air Force Reserve in December. So I can say some of these things a little more freely like you can. And, and the reality is it's deeply, deeply concerning. You know, we, we have a crisis of leadership. We have, we've disconnected some fundamental ideas and concepts like just war theory, self-defense and all those things within our military. So that's coming. And now we're seeing, you know, chaplains, military chaplains. If you're a conservative Christian chaplain, life is getting harder and harder for you. Um, you know, even chaplains are at times prevented from praying in Jesus name. Yeah. Um, there's a tremendous pressure on chaplains yeah. to compromise and do same sex weddings. Um, all those things are there. And then the abortion issue, transgender issues are coming. I have people that are very close to me that are military commanders that don't want to sign off on orders to allow someone to get paid to go and have an abortion out of state right. or to pay for transgender surgery. So those battles that those are the future battles that we're seeing, because, again, we, we've disconnected from, you know, a Christian biblical law basis. We've disconnected from our foundations and it's chaos. Um, it's creating a lot of problems. And it, it's why you have a recruiting crisis in the military today, I think. Yeah. You know, not everyone who doesn't want to serve in the military that might have five years ago is going to be able to articulate it that way. But if there's not faith that that the what you're doing is just and the cause is righteous, why are you going to go through what we sure. go through in the military and training yeah. and deployments yeah. and all of that? You're not going to do it. Um, yeah. And that's a big problem. It's it's a. It, it's so hard to deal with even emotionally um, to see what has happened in our military. I just. Uh, just this last weekend, went to the 20th anniversary of uh, the Battle of Baghdad on April 10th, 2003. That was our battalion. And we had, I think there were 800 people there. It was amazing to, to reconnect. And it, it was such a wonderful time, um, but also a sad time because 20 years ago, the military was a different place than it is right now. And 20 years is not that long, but a different place. And to think about what the servicemen and women that are in the military right now are dealing with, um, I have always talked to my boys about, you know, military service, even, you know, going to the reserves, that'll be good for you. And not not now, not anymore. No. Um, because as you mentioned, we don't even know what the military is going to look like in the next several years. 
Um, so many great people still there. And I'm, again, very proud of, you know, not only my service, but the folks that I know that are still serving. But things are changing rapidly. Uh, thank you for what you're doing on that front. Thank you for clarity. Um, we are struggling as Christians because we just, I don't even think we try to understand. We, we're so busy reading tweets and, <laughs> and uh, Instagram posts. We're not going deep on anything. And so the world is, is doing an end run and we're losing. Um, so it's important to understand. Where can people follow you and, and know more about the work that you're doing? I just mentioned Twitter. You're on Twitter. You're very active on Twitter, actually. And I think people should read your, your tweets, of course. Um, <laughs> well, I appreciate that. They should go deeper than that. So where can people follow you? <laughs> yeah, so it's at Davis Yance on Twitter. So at D-A-V-I-S Yance on Twitter. The website for my law firm is Yance, my last name, YanceLaw.com. Those are two great places. We post a lot on Facebook as well. And there's more coming. I'm partnering with some pastors and some Navy SEALs and others um, to to do some work for the military and, and hopefully mm -hmm. encourage revival in the military. So we'll be talking about that more. That's definitely a project I want to talk to you about um, mm -hmm. offline and then in the future as we roll that out. So there's good things coming, but those are two places uh, for now to follow me. And man, just thank you for your service, brother. God bless you mm -hmm. for all the work you're doing. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing, too. I really appreciate your stand and your very public stand. So thank you for doing that. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll talk again. We'll dive deep into some of these other issues. But uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care. We were not made to live in isolation. Sadly, many of our veterans feel they need to fight their battles alone. This self-isolation has led to the staggering statistic of more than 20 veterans taking their lives every day. A lot of guys end up drinking, a lot of guys end up losing hope. Some of them will go to the VA and they'll try to get, you know, prescription medications to help with PTSD. You know, they'll get pills for anxiety, they'll get pills because they can't sleep, now they'll get pills for depression before they know it. They're taking 12 different medications. And when it's not working out, these guys lose hope, and that's why there's 23 guys a day committing suicide. The mission of Mighty Oaks is to eradicate the veteran suicide epidemic and help our warriors change their legacies. As a result, we've been able to help over 4,000 veterans and first responders by equipping them with the tools they need to live the lives they were created to live. Everything they said just kept hitting me in the heart over and over and over again. It's like all the things that I didn't know that I needed to hear. And uh, I opened my heart to God that week, dude, and like, <laughs> I've been a different person ever since. Our faith-based, peer-to-peer approach has one of the highest success rates of any program available today, offering hope and understanding to those who need it most. We provide our programs and resources, including travel, at no cost to our warriors. I remember talking to a licensed uh, social worker who actually handed me a pamphlet to Mighty Oaks. So I went, and I'm glad I did. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these men and women are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. Our mission is to serve and restore our nation's warriors and families who have endured hardship through their service to America, and to help them find new life purpose through hope in Christ. It's your generosity that can make a difference in the lives of the men and women who have fought for our country and our freedoms. Now that they're home, don't let them fight alone. Learn more at MightyOaksPrograms.org. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better, Mike Lindell with MyPillow is launching the MyPillow 2.0. When Mike invented MyPillow, it had everything you could ever want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he discovered a new technology that makes it even better. The MyPillow 2.0 has the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow, and now with a brand new fabric that is made with a temperature regulating thread. The MyPillow 2.0 is the softest, smoothest and coolest pillow you'll ever own. For our exclusive listeners, the MyPillow 2.0 is buy one, get one free offer with promo code SITREP. MyPillow 2.0 temperature regulating technology is 100% made in the USA and comes with a 10 year warranty and a 60 day money back guarantee. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square to buy the one, get one free offer. Enter promo code SITREP or call 800-870-0283 to get your MyPillow 2.0 now. I appreciate that conversation, of course, and there is so much more we could talk about. Uh, 
obviously, if you listen to that interview, you know we could have gone really, really deep on any of those three topics, really, that I presented. Uh, I have a hard time sometimes narrowing it down to just one aspect. Uh, I, I believe that the First Amendment, our right to speak and to worship is protected by the Second Amendment. Without the Second, there would be no First. Uh, we would have no recourse, no ability to defend ourselves or protect ourselves. So those two are connected, of course, but they are separate issues in that each one has nuance and depth that we could go into. And then talking about what has happened and is happening in the military, uh, so many different issues that we can address, and, and I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to go deeper on each of those at some point in the future, but please uh, follow Davis, uh, learn uh, really from him. He has such a great perspective on not only the law, what it is and, and where it came from historically, but how we as Christians should view what's happening from a legal standpoint in our world. Please go and check that out. Whatever podcast platform you are listening from, please make sure that you are subscribed or following whatever that button says on your podcast platform. Go ahead and click that. That would be fantastic. You will be notified as soon as episodes come out a couple of different times a week. And then go over to thesitrep.org, thesitrep.org, and you can find out more about the show, find archived episodes of the show, all the contact information that you need, as well as a place to sign up for our newsletter. We'd love to have you join us there. Again, thank you so much for watching or listening, and we look forward to talking to you next time.